In today's seemingly divided world, it can be a refreshing and welcoming thought to remember the things that we all have in common. The fact that we all share this planet and take joy in many of the same things. Arguably, one of these common threads is Disney movies. For well over a century, Disney has been enchanting audiences of all ages, starting all the way back in 1928 with the now iconic Mickey Mouse and the groundbreaking Steamboat Willie to the full-length animated motion pictures we enjoy today. With such a long and beloved history, it shouldn't be a surprise that some of our most cherished films may hold far deeper and more thought-provoking meanings than we realised. So today, we're looking at some of the hidden meanings in Disney movies and the possible reasons behind them. Now before we get started, don't forget to head over to our Patreon page, where for just $2, you can watch our newest edition of The Murderous Minds, a full feature documentary on Joseph Mengler, the Angel of Death. By becoming a patron, you'll also get access to two other documentaries we have on there already, A Murderous Minds on Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and the documentary on Stanley Kubrick. Our next Murderous Minds will be on Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre, and you can get access to all of those for just $2 per month on Patreon, as these videos will not be uploaded to YouTube. But like we've said, if you genuinely cannot afford $2 per month for these documentaries, email info at topfives.co.uk. Thank you for your support. Without the Patreons, we would not be able to keep up the Murderous Minds and other documentaries. Now, let's get started. Finding Nemo Before we start with the possible deeper meanings of Finding Nemo, all of this will sound a little hard to believe, but bear in mind that Nemo literally translates to nobody in Latin. Finding Nemo released in May 2003 was a big Disney Pixar hit, a technical breakthrough even by CGI standards in terms of water physics not associated with any pre-existing fairy tale. The story is about a loving father, Marlin, going on an incredible journey to find his lost son. But is it possible that Finding Nemo isn't the happy story we all know and adore? As it turns out, a strong argument can be made that Finding Nemo is in fact a story about a father coming to terms with his family's death and the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance and upon second viewing, it's easy to see the parallels. At the beginning of the movie, we clearly see Marlin's wife and their unhatched children all died by a barracuda attack. Marlin appears to be in shock as he struggles to process what's just happened. Surveying his home, he discovers the one egg that, while ravaged, seemingly survived. We quickly move forward in time to see a young Nemo who is ready to start his first day of school in spite of his father's reservations. The theory states Nemo never truly existed, that he, along with the rest of the family, perished in the attack, resulting in Marling entering the first stage of grief, denial. By protecting in his mind the idea that one of his children survived, Marlin is rejecting reality. The additional fact that Nemo is disabled is also no consequence. By adding this denial in his mind, Marlin masks his illusion. With Nemo's injury, the absence of things like leaving home or having outside interactions become much more plausible. We quickly see Marlin enter the second stage with anger. He is clearly annoyed and agitated at the world, who all try to convince him to let Nemo go. He argues his various points and is resistant to all of their well-meaning intentions. We are then introduced to arguably the most popular character in the franchise, Dory on the third stage, bargaining. Not only does Marlin literally bargain Dory to help him find his son, he also spends a good part of the movie dealing with Dory's amnesia-caused antics in this same way. The fourth stage, depression, comes when Marlin casts Dory out of his life, believing that he had ultimately failed at his attempt to bring his son home. This sadness is overwhelmed as he finally comprehends the thought that he is alone. This allows Marlin to reach the final stage, acceptance. Now admittedly, this one is a little more up to interpretation, simply due to the fact that this is a family film, and true to form, Disney movies all have their happy endings. But as is presented, after Marlin finds Nemo, bringing him home and letting him go to school, he is finally able to let his son go. This is represented in Marlin's overall attitude and change in behaviour. Bargaining 
Bambi. Bambi is Disney's fifth feature-length film, and it was released in 1942 during World War II. However, this first release yielded little attention, and it wasn't until it was re-released in 1947 that it was recognised as the beloved classic we think of today. But few realise the film was based on a 1923 book called Bambi, A Life in the Woods, originally written for adults by an Austrian author named Felix Selton. In the book version, Bambi was a roe deer, not the cutesy white-tailed deer we see in the Disney adaptation, and the story was an altogether more gruesome account about the dangers of life in the woods and the looming cruelty of humans. It was also considered one of the first environmental novels ever written. Similar to the film, it does feature the tragic loss of Bambi's mother, who was shot by hunters, although there are none of the cute little friends to comfort him and most of Bambi's guidance comes from his elusive father, who at one graphic point in the book takes Bambi to the body of a fatally shot man to prove to him that humans aren't immortal. The story was also controversial and considered by some as a parable to the treatment of Jews in Europe, and it was actually banned in Nazi Germany and many copies of the novel were burned. Even Disney's watered-down version of the original story caused controversy after it included the traumatic death scene of Bambi's mother, which is still considered too intense for kids of younger ages, with many debating how old a child should be before they are exposed to such a tragedy. However, apart from that one scene, Disney pretty much smoothed over the harsh realities and messages intended from the original story, and replaced it with sweetness and light leaving out the guttural growl the original Bambi roe deer would have made when wooing feline and replacing it with a doe-eyed courtship, with hardly a mention of the anti-hunting theme of the original story. Also left out are the drawn-out detailed descriptions of woodland animal deaths, not only from human hunters who are considered the enemy throughout the story, but also from starvation, disease and attacks by other animal predators. And in the book, there is no happy ending for Bambi either, and although he does fall in love with his cousin, they don't stay together, and Bambi spends much of his time alone. He is also shot by hunters, and although he recovers, he still remains alone, and under the influence of an elder stag, who he doesn't realise is his father until it's too late. Bambi is also unaware, he has fathered twins with his cousin, and he only meets them fleetingly towards the end of the book. So the overall message of the real Bambi story is to highlight important environmental issues and show how wildlife struggles to survive in the hostile environment of the forest, with the ever-looming threat of its main enemy, humans. Alice in Wonderland We've all gone down the internet rabbit hole, usually late at night when we end up browsing random topics that lead from one site to another getting caught up in some weird obsession about something we never knew existed. While although the phrase internet rabbit hole is relatively new, the term originated from the novel Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, written in 1965 by Lewis Carroll, a nonsensical story of a young girl who falls down an actual rabbit hole into a fantasy world, populated by anthropomorphic creatures a story that has been adapted by Disney in various formats over the years, with the most recent being the 2016 film Through the Looking Glass. And although these adaptations are aimed at children, it seems the original story may have had a far deeper meaning, a more sinister one. Let's start with how it all began, and the slightly odd friendship the adult Charles Dodgson aka Lewis Carroll had with a 10-year-old girl named Alice Little. Carol first recited the story of Wonderland to Alice and her sisters during a boat trip down the Thames, and she persuaded him to turn it into a novel. However, Alice wasn't the only young girl Carol befriended. He had several young playmates, who he would often pose with or take photographs of sometimes in various states of undress, something that in this day and age would be viewed as entirely inappropriate. This has led many to believe Carol had an unhealthy interest in young girls and was possibly a repressed deviant. Although it's worth pointing out, there is no evidence of this and we are by no means accusing someone who is not around to defend themselves of this. Then there is the link to mind-altering drugs. The magical and often trippy adventure that Alice goes on in the story has been raising eyebrows for a long time. 
This was further fueled in the 1960s by the lyrics to Jefferson Aeroplane's song White Rabbit, that is full of drug references linked to Alice's adventures. More recently, a line from The Matrix also alludes to the story, with the line by Morpheus that offers Neo two options, and if you have seen the most recent adaptation, through the looking glass, it's not surprising that people think Carol must have been tripped out on psychedelic drugs when he wrote the book. Another view is that the book is a guise for Carol's political views, as he reputedly had mixed feelings about Queen Victoria, especially the corrupt legal system she had created, and his depiction of the Queen of Hearts as a bombastic and somewhat evil character is a vile reference to his disdain for Queen Victoria. Although evidently, she herself loved the book and was blissfully unaware any of it was aimed at her, if it was. These are just a few of the many alleged hidden meanings in the Alice in Wonderland story, and as generations move on and social morales change, so does the interpretation of this famous book. But what seems apparent after all these years is that there was a hidden meaning in the text of Lewis Carroll, and if he's widely believed, was a political satirist who took drugs and had relations with underage girls, is Alice in Wonderland really a story that Disney should aim at children? What do you make of these theories? Again, we are not saying any of these are true, these are just the many points that people raise when going down the rabbit hole, that is, Alice in Wonderland's origins. Up Released in 2009, Up was the unconventional story of Carl Fredrickson, a disgruntled old man trying to cope with the loss of his beloved wife Ellie, before being swept up into a larger-than-life adventure. Early in the movie, Carl is told he must move into an assisted living center. Unwilling to leave his home, Carl attaches thousands of balloons to his house as it soars off to Paradise Falls. Along for the ride is Russell, a young boy scout desperately seeking to earn the final merit badge needed to become a true wilderness explorer. An unlikely friendship soon forms between the two main characters as they work together to make it back home. True to form, this Disney Pixar film indeed has its happily ever after, with Carl learning to enjoy life again while Russell gains a positive male role model in his life. But could there be more to this fun and imaginative story? The popular theory states that Carl actually committed suicide the night before he was court ordered to live at Shady Oaks, and what we see is his journey into the afterlife. This can be seen in all of the preparation he does to prepare the house for its takeoff. Carl is not only calm, but he is also determined, and happy to complete his task. As we watch the whimsical scene of the house floating off into the sky, many think this could be likened to Carl ascending into heaven, or at least a kind of limbo. After this point, we are introduced to Russell, a young boy looking to complete the Boy Scout-like task he needed, specifically assisting the elderly. This can be easily interpreted as Russell being in fact, Carl's guardian angel. A common analogy of similar stories, a guardian angel earning their wings. Even the house itself can be seen as Carl's unyielding attachment to the past and his desire to hold on to Ellie forever. In many ways, this is Carl's unfinished business, preventing him from reaching the afterlife, which is exactly the reason he needs Russell's help. Appearing as a child, something that Carl would naturally be bitter towards, as he and Ellie could never have children. Through Russell's innocent persistence, he helps remind Carl that even when faced with great tragedy and loss, there is always a reason to continue living. Carl soon finds his joy again and forms a special bond with Russell, finding room in his heart for the love of the son he never had. In turn, it's believed in this theory that Carl's suicide attempt ultimately fails, and he is given the choice to stay or go. Stay in Paradise Falls slash Heaven with the remnants of Ellie, or go back and live the rest of his life. Choosing the latter, he returns home with Russell and his other companions in peace and with renewed purpose. It sounds hard to believe, but what do you make of this? The Lion King When it comes to Disney movies, most people have their preferences between classic and modern, with each decade seemingly representing a new era of film. But the one that bridges those gaps is arguably one of the best Disney films ever made, The Lion King. Released in June 1994, it was a mega hit that holds dear to just as many today as it did when it came out. The story seems simple enough, and I'm sure almost all of you are familiar with it. 
But here's a quick recap. Simba, a young lion cub, is the prince of the Pride Lands. Carefree, he is learning about his place in the world, with guidance from his father, Mufasa. Simba is trying to comprehend that he will one day be king of the African savanna, just like his father before him. It's only through cruel intervention from Simba's treacherous uncle Scar that Simba's privileged life is shattered, resulting in both the tragic death of Mufasa and Simba's bittersweet exile. Through the helpful intervention of the comedic duo of Timon and Pumbaa, Simba is raised to forget his traumatic childhood and focus on living his life for the here and now. But after years of running, Simba's new life collides with his childhood, forcing him to confront his past and ultimately taking his rightful place as King of the Pride Lands. This movie is so beloved, most can quote it by heart line for line, but is there something more? What if this pop culture icon's roots run much deeper than the collective imagination of the writer's room at Disney headquarters? Again, after almost 30 years, some have pointed out the fascinating parallel between The Lion King and William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Think of Simba as Hamlet, both the rightful heirs to the throne in a long-running line of royalty. Both are betrayed by their spiteful and jealous uncles. In The Lion King, it's Scar. In Hamlet, it's Claudius. Both are tragic and pivotal moments in each story respectively. Both schemed to look like accidental deaths of the main character's father, while simultaneously casting out their nephews to overthrow the kingdom. Both stories are filled with colourful and fleshed out supporting characters. For The Lion King, it's Timon and Pumbaa, which share striking similarities between Hamlet, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz. And while the latter were more or less spies working for the Hamlet's uncle, it's only fair to point out that if you recall Timon and Pumbaa's original intent for Simba was entirely selfish, and it was only later on that they developed an actual loving bond with Simba. In both works, we have the female lead slash romantic interest. In Hamlet, it's Ophelia, where in The Lion King, it's Nala. Similarly, there is a connection between The Lion King's Rafiki and Hamlet's Horatio. Both serve the corresponding families as a kind of advisor and ally. Furthermore, it is with the use of these characters that our main protagonists are introduced to the spirits of their deceased fathers. Both shared similar sentiments of remember who you are, resulting in our heroes gaining the courage to go back and right the wrongs of the past. Bear in mind, while these similarities are strong, at the end of the day, one is a Shakespearean epic filled with many dark themes and great tragedy. The other is a more light-hardened family film with some difficult life lessons refined for children to grasp. What do you make of these similarities? So that's the real stories and possible origins behind these five Disney movies. We hope you've enjoyed, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on these. Don't forget to check out our Patreon, where for just $2 per month, you can get exclusive access to all of our documentaries that will not be uploaded to YouTube. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.